Motherfuckers, you listening to the power movement. Welcome to the Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and I am just back from the sleigh ride bank slalom at Stevens Pass, and I want to thank everyone who worked hard to make this event happen. We raised a ton of money for the Fred Hutchinson Clinic, and they have the goal of ending cancer, and I was stoked to be a part of this event. But we're not here to talk about fundraising events. We are here to talk with athletes. And this week on the show, we have one of the most talented skiers on the planet, and a guy who doesn't get as much respect or credit as he should in the ski world. I'm talking about Will Wesson. For those of you who don't know about Will, he's one of the stars of Line's Traveling Circus, a media property that has taken over the ski industry over the past decade. Will was also the winner of the first X Games Real Street contest, and while his skiing speaks louder than most, his personality is a quiet one. But I get Will talking on the podcast. Before we get into it, I want to ask you to follow me on Instagram at the Powell Movement. Tell your friends about the show and email me with any questions or guest suggestions that you may have for me. My email is mike at the and I will get back to you. Finally, I want to thank my sponsors who make this show happen. They're Evo, Rescue Water, Spy Optic, and the Ten Barrel Brewery. Now, let's talk to Will Wesson. How was your trip, man? Oh, it was good. It was not quite as productive as we hoped, but it was fun. So that's what really counts. Where'd you go? We were in Helsinki the whole time, pretty much, in Finland. And what, was there no snow there or something? There was actually a ton of snow there and got expectations a little bit high, maybe. And then it rained quite a bit. And there was still plenty of snow to do what we needed to do, but just not quite as epic snow conditions as we were hoping for. Is it just the rain ruins the snow that you need to shovel to create features? Because I would think for you guys, as long as there's snow, you can get work done. Yeah, I mean, there was about three feet of snow, and then it rained down to about seven inches to a foot in places. And then it got kind of cold, so it was basically ice block type stuff, (laughs) which sucks for shoveling and landing on. It's nice to have like about two feet of snow and then have like sidewalks covered and stuff so you're not pissing people off when you're making landings or in runs to features. It's just nice when it's kind of wintry everywhere and you don't stick out quite as much. I could see that. And how long were you gone? Like two weeks? A little over three weeks. When you come home from a trip like that and you don't get the footage or you don't get the clips that you want, it wasn't as productive as you wanted it to be. Is that just a total letdown and it makes you scramble to make things happen for the rest of your season? Uh, no. I mean, every year there's trips that are super productive and some that are not so productive, and you kind of just expect that. And as long as you had a good time and if you come all in one piece, it's the best thing. Unfortunately, LJ tweaked his knee a little bit, so that was part of the bummers of the trip. But otherwise, it was semi-productive and wasn't the worst, wasn't the best. Okay. Well, it's rare that I put a guy on the podcast who doesn't like to talk that much, and not that you don't like to talk. But I've seen you over the years. You used to come into the K2 offices when you were doing your line stuff. And I would chit-chat here and there with Andy Perry, who's your partner in crime. But you were always the quiet one. And it was odd, as I knew you from your skiing, because your skiing spoke louder than most people's. Have you always been a man of few words? Uh, I think so. Andy, at least in the videos we make, always has something ridiculous or funny to say. And sometimes it's so ridiculous we have to edit it out. But a lot of times... It's very entertaining, so really adds some life to our videos. And I'm kind of more like the instigator of situations or trying to let my skiing do the talking type thing. When I look at the interviews with you and Andy, when you're doing something for any type of media outlet out there, you are the one who answers a small fraction of the questions. Andy handles the majority and you're kind of just standing there. Do you ever feel awkward in those situations? Uh, No, I mean, definitely we're both equal parts of the equation, I guess, in our line videos there. So we just do what we do. Sometimes one guy's a little more behind the scenes for certain things, and the talking is happening. That's when I'm behind the scenes a little more, I guess. And have you ever thought about, why am I like that? Or you just feel like you only need to talk when you have something important to say? Yeah, I think it's more of that. I just don't feel like unnecessary to chat is always something I'm into. It's more like, okay, let's get stuff done and make stuff happen. 
hopefully. When you go on this trip with LJ and you're in Helsinki, I mean, do you change? Is there a side of Will that no one sees in the media, but all his good buddies see? Like, oh man, Will does talk a lot. It's just you have to get him away from people or does that not happen ever? I mean, I guess my friends would answer that best, but for sure, I'm definitely a little more talkative with just my ski friends and on a trip like that when you got four or five guys in close quarters pretty much hanging out 24 7 in in the car or doubling somewhere or skiing or sleeping in the same room or whatever of course you're gonna talk but i mean the part of yourself that you show in the media is pretty quiet and reserved and i wonder if there's another side of will that we don't see i'm sure there's some sort of side you don't see definitely with friends in private it's a lot more relaxed i guess i wouldn't like talk to someone i don't know about something really uncomfortable for them to talk about so when it's personal and more like friendly i guess more topics come up and it's not so weird well if you ever want to make people uncomfortable that you don't know and ask them a lot of questions i can help you with that because i do that quite often <laughs> are your mom and dad quiet too or is it the way that you came out? My mom is a bit. I'd say my dad is definitely more of a talker, at least if it's on a topic he's super into. I guess you could say that I'm like my dad in that way. If you're talking about urban skiing, definitely will be part of the conversation. But if we're talking about like politics, I'll probably just hang in the background and let people say what they want to say. But yeah, my mom was a little bit quieter and my dad's probably more talkative. I tied them in so we could talk about where you grew up and where were you born and raised? Rochester, New York, Finger Lakes region. What is that near? It's about halfway between Buffalo and Syracuse. So like Buffalo, Niagara Falls, like Canadian border is probably a little more famous than Rochester area. And then Syracuse, people maybe know that through sports or something. Western New York, probably about four and a half hours away from New York City. So Every time I say I'm from New York, I have to clarify. You're not from New York City. Yeah, it's a lot more rural. Growing up, did skiing for you start with cross-country skiing? It did. Yeah, actually, my father had a good friend in our neighborhood who was like competitively Nordic skiing and doing like citizen races and stuff and got my dad into it and he then got our entire family into it. And before I knew it, in like second or third grade, I was going to little races all around Western New York and in the Adirondacks and stuff. Yeah, that's how I started skiing was cross-country ski racing. Did you take your cross-country skis and hit a jump and that changes everything for you? Basically. This is probably around fifth or sixth grade. We had a cross-country ski race that was at Macaulay Mountain, New York in the Adirondacks, and they also had downhill skiing, and I had never been downhill skiing. And on the day off, we kind of got a chance to try out downhill skiing, and then after that, we kind of hit jumps on our cross-country skis whenever we could build a jump or something, and basically just started breaking cross-country equipment and disappointing my dad and being like, oh, I think I'm going to start going downhill and a little bit less uphill. You cross-country ski for like three years pretty seriously. And when I say seriously, your dad was serious about it, so you had to be kind of serious about it. Do you leave cross-country behind for good from there? Pretty much. Yeah, I'd done cross-country skiing relatively seriously, driving hours to events and doing races, and I was doing pretty well. And my dad and my dad's friend I was talking about, they were pretty psyched on my results and were like, oh, yeah, you're like tall and skinny. You could be like an Olympic cross-country ski racer if you just keep going. You'll be the next Oli Einar Bjorndalen. Yeah, it was always talk about Bjorn, Bjorn Dali, a Norwegian guy who won a bunch of gold medals yep. back in those days. I met him. Oh, cool. <laughs> so I guess my dad was like a little bit bummed because I was kind of on track to be pretty good at that. And then I chose what was more fun, which was going off jumps and rails with my friends, doing things that didn't have rules as much. So you hit a jump on your cross-country skis, and then you come back home from that race, and you're like, Dad, I want to get some alpine gear, and I want to go to the local mountain? Kind of. I feel like it was somewhat of a transition, because a few of my friends were already skiing and snowboarding, and I just didn't have the equipment. So 
for Christmas one year, I got Solomon Snowblades. That was like the boom of the Snowblades. I actually rollerbladed and skateboarded in the summer, and that was like the closest thing I could think to rollerblading. So I was like, oh, yeah, just do the same stuff I do in the summer on the Snowblades. So is this 98, 99-ish? Yeah, exactly. The Snowblade was just coming into fashion, per se, as Solomon was selling a shit ton of them. And it was the closest thing to rollerblading, and there's still an amazing Snowblade event in Squaw Valley, March 23rd this year, that you should really attend, being a former snowblader. It is the Payne McSchlonky. It's the last one ever. And there is a snowblade race that'll pretty much crown the best snowblader in the world for all time this year. So I think you should go. But it's all ski boards back then, because I think that's what people were calling them, at least in New England, because I think that's where Line Skis was from, and they started with ski boards. But you had a crew of skiers. I mean, it eventually became the I Hate New York crew. How do you meet up with your first little crew of skiers at the mountain? I mean, are you, is it Bristol Mountain that you're going to? Exactly. Yeah, our home mountain is Bristol Mountain. is about 30 minutes away. So we were lucky enough to be able to go night skiing after school if we had enough time and did our homework or whatever. And the crew sort of formed through some of my friends from other sports. Like I I did a ton of sports when I was younger, soccer and basketball, baseball, track and field, swimming. What were you best at? I played soccer the longest. I played that all the way through high school, finished off in varsity. But best at, I don't really know if I was super standout at one or the other. I got the most into basketball, probably, but tested on all the sports. And I never really played football or hockey because my parents weren't super down with the equipment and my friends just tended to be in all these other sports. So eventually, Andy Perry came into the equation. He was kind of a friend of a friend. We did like a lot of skateboarding, rollerblading, like I said, in the summer. And I did some of that with him in the summer. And then he was in my like study hall, my homeroom class is what they called it, freshman year. That's when it really was like, okay, we're just going to ski as much as we possibly can. And Andy is... He's a great guy. I would say he's a little weird, and I think that's how he likes it as well. He's not your cookie-cutter type dude, which is great. You seem a little bit more normal, per se, and it sounds like from high school you were playing a lot of team sports as well as skiboarding. And was Andy weird when you first met him? Has he always been that way? (laughs) When I first met him, I just knew him through like rollerblading and stuff. But uh, then as we became friends in our study hall, we were kind of opposites almost. I was like a little more jockey, I guess, just from playing sports. And I had started to quit those sports year by year. So I was moving away from that towards more and more skiing. But he was on the other spectrum playing magic cards and stuff with some other guys coming at it from that direction more and more towards skiing too. So we were kind of meeting in the middle. Did you ever play Magic the Gathering with Andy? Is that a game that you're into as well? Uh, I don't think I ever played it with him. One of my friends long before had a bunch of cards and I remember him trying to explain it to me at like a swim meet in like fifth grade or something, but I don't think I ever actually played with Andy. How does the rest of the crew come together? Because that I hate New York crew, there was a ton of people involved in that crew and maybe you and Andy might have been the first or the first two friends to hang out, but how did the whole crew come together? We kind of had our own little friend groups based on our geographic locations. Like Andy and I grew up in the same hometown, like five minutes apart. So we're going to the same high school, obviously. And Domet and Gry are brothers, and they live five minutes away from the ski area. So they were always there. I think they probably started the earliest out of everybody skiing. And then like Eric Olson, he was kind of coming out of right field from Lyons, New York, which is a bit further away and had kind of a crew from there. I think we just all met up through the local ski events and through our, like, struggles of trying to convince our home mountain to build a terrain park. And at one point, we bought an avalanche shovel, and we didn't even know it was an avalanche shovel. We thought it was just, like, a small shovel that we could hide in our jacket just so we could build jumps on the moguls because there was no terrain park, and ski patrol was not stoked when we build jumps. So if we had a shovel, we could do it really fast and kind of get away with it. Not having a terrain park, it created the need for you guys to build the backyard setup. And in looking at your old videos, it looked like you and Andy both had backyard setups at your house. 
And it looked like Andy's house was more no rules. His was kind of more janky, I would say, than the one at your house. And then the one at your house is like the real thing. Like your dad really went all out to make sure that you guys had the materials to have a sick backyard set up, which is, I think, what drove the progression of your whole crew, both yours and Andy's house. And I think the main difference from what you see in the videos is your house looked a little bit more professional and you guys had to wear helmets. Andy's house looked like the place that if you fell, you might get a screw sticking into your leg. <laughs> uh, it's somewhat accurate, I would say. My house is still pretty do-it-yourself, learn-as-a-go style, but my dad was definitely instrumental in all of that and like you said we're really supportive and into what we were doing basically like once he saw that we were all obsessed with it he was just like what can i do to help you guys do this safely like it looked pretty dangerous so one you have to wear a helmet if you come to our house <laughs> he would make like a net and dry wear helmets and i think this edit where they have to wear bike helmets one time because they purposely didn't bring their helmet yeah he was big on safety and Definitely was just like, how can we do this the safest and most fun way without you guys getting hurt? Like, you're always complaining about icy landings and, like, really poorly built features at your train park. Like, we finally did convince the resort to have a train park, but it wasn't great. And we're like, well, if we just build our own jumps, we can just chop up the landing. And even if it's ice, we can make it, like, chopped ice. It hurts a lot less to fall on that. So we kind of customize the feature to the trick we want to learn and a little bit more work, but we kind of learn the lessons of building your own feature, which I feel like a lot of kids might not get if they have like a perfect park to ski every day. Your dad went above and beyond the call of duty and with that too. I mean, I believe he bought you snowmaking gear so you could always have a setup with snow in the winter. Yeah. So I was like, Hey, I think you can like make your own snow and like did a bunch of research and he was like, well, if you figure out how to do that, I'll look into it or whatever. And so I found the Backyard Blizzard, which was a home snowmaker that had in the, like those old airplane magazines with like ridiculous products you can buy. Yep. And basically convinced him to try it out. He was pretty into cross-country skiing, like I said, so he was stoked to control the weather too because in New York we have not so great winters sometimes. Sometimes it can be okay. Sometimes it's pretty wet and dry, dry for no wise at least. And yeah, he ended up buying like four or five and kind of almost becoming a rep for the company in order to help pay for ours because they weren't cheap. And that was crazy. <laughs> that was insane that we could make our own snow if it was cold enough, I'd say. And he sold one to the local weatherman who's on TV and like, that guy just turned it on and his backyard was flat and he just ran it nonstop when it was cold until he made like a sledding hill for his kids. We luckily had a small hill and kind of built a jump and some things out of hay bales to try to make less snow because it's pretty expensive to make snow. Yep. But it was insane. It was really cool that my dad was that supportive into it. From there, you guys were able to put edits together on newschoolers.com and it really puts your crew on the map. And when I think back this time, I'm going to say it's around maybe 2005, 2008-ish. I don't know if those years sound right, but I think that's when you guys kind of evolve and really get your skiing toe. It's something that you can show the public. And I look at that time as there was maybe three crews out there that were doing something different than the rest of the world. And I look at Stepped, 4x9, and the I Hate New York crew as those three different crews. But you guys were the ones who were forgotten about because you're on the East Coast and thank God you had new schoolers that gave you a platform to show people what you were doing. And do you look at it at that time in skiing as those were the crews that were really making a difference? Oh, uh, there's a few more. There's originally it's called like the P crew, I think, the Pinner crew from Western Canadian guys, I think from Vernon mostly. A lot of those guys became pretty famous comp skiers and backcountry skiers and stuff. And I think even before four by nine it was round top riders was like East Beth, Tom Wallace, and Tom Warnick, and a few other guys. Then, like, Stepped actually formed a little bit later, too. It was kind of like our crew kind of formed in high school, and so did, like, Round Top Riders, I think. And then there was, like, the Academy kids at CVA and at Waterville that were doing their thing. And then when everybody went to college, like, a few years later, 
stepped really took off and four by nine formed in Utah. And there was definitely like a really big boom of college age or like late high school age crews. That was like your thing. You like form a crew and you make videos. Some of the things that you were doing back then, you personally, when I think of like your buttering to rails, I hadn't seen that before. At least I can't remember seeing it before. Most of your tricks, you're doing both ways at a time when people weren't doing that. And at that point, at least in your inner circle, did everybody realize how hard the shit that you were doing was? Or is it just, oh, that's Will? I don't really know. Like you said, we did a lot of skiing in our backyards. And once you learn a trick, it's like a really good feeling. And then you're like, okay, well, might as well learn how to do it the other direction too. And then if there's a handrail that only has stairs on one side and a drop on the other, then I can do it either way. And not like limited to one way. I don't know. It was always like I met in Gry where I was doing like the hardest jump tricks. I met was super good at rails too. He's really good. And me and Andy were doing some weird technical rail tricks. And Eric Olson was also a really good jumper and like really good in the half pipe. We all complimented each other in our strengths and weaknesses in our crew. Did you guys live separate lives in high school? Was it like you had your ski crew on one side and then a double life in high school and you were a jock in that respect and everybody had their own high school life as well? Or was it full on, I'm a skier all the time and then you played the other sports? Maybe in the beginning of high school, it was like sort of half, half lives there in and out of skiing. But definitely we all just gravitated to 100% skiing as much as we could by the end of high school and like... I was still playing soccer, but I think I quit everything else so I could have more time to hit the backyard setup. So it was like skiing around because we had our little AstroTurf setups and didn't really need snow. And we even had insulation. Like the pink stuff? Not the pink stuff, but like more expensive, like shiny silver stuff. In one of the episodes there, and he called it like NASA space material or something. Okay. But we were even covering our backyard snow with that in the spring to make it last as long as we possibly could and had like a one foot wide in run going into this jump that had no snow anywhere except for the takeoff and the landing. And like, we were fully like obsessed and trying to make anything happen that we could with what we had. So you guys were total nerds about making sure your snow didn't melt and anything you could do to conserve it was a big win for you. Oh, for sure. And yeah, going to the ice rink, like one of our friends, dads had a, pretty big delivery van and we like convinced him one time to use it for hauling snow andy's mom's minivan definitely suffered really bad the suspension was probably destroyed by us taking it to the ice rink and filling it with a tarp with snow we're going for it (laughs) kind of ridiculous when you graduate high school you end up picking university of vermont and that seems like a no-brainer for you you're a few hours from home a lot of the crew is heading up towards that way how does that change things for you? Do you start focusing more on school or is skiing still the priority for you? I definitely chose University of Vermont based on its proximity to snow, probably more than academics. It was between Boulder and UVM, and I chose UVM because it was a little closer to home and also slightly better academic-wise for the things I wanted to do. And I didn't really know what I was missing at that point with Western skiing. I was like, what's powder? I don't know. Who cares? So let's go hit handrails as much as we can. And Vermont's way better than New York. It's a kind of still a stepping stone as you're going up the ladder of quality of skiing places. But then we eventually moved west after that anyway. Okay. And I'm going to take a real quick break to talk about my sponsors. And my first sponsor is Evo. And they've supported the podcast since day one. If you're a fan of the show, I hope you buy your skis, snowboard, bikes, outerwear, everything from Evo. They're the best retail experience in Denver, Seattle, Portland, and Whistler. And their website, evo.com, features the best prices, an amazing user experience, a no-hassle return policy, and free shipping on orders over $50. If you're in-store, let them know you listen to the Powell Movement, and you'll get an additional 10% off. My next sponsor is Rescue Water. They are Proactive Recovery and another longtime supporter of the show who makes a product I believe in. Drink one rescue water after working out or a big night and you will feel the difference in hydration. It's time to say goodbye to your traditional sports drink and try rescue water. You can pick some up at the store, 
on Amazon or head on over to rescuewater.com. That's R-E-S-Q water.com. Enter the code rescuewater, T-P-M, that's all one word, and you will save 20% off a 12-pack or 24-pack case. Those are my sponsors, so we'll get back into it. So you're in college, and at this point, I mean, towards the end of high school and in college, are you guys traveling around to all the local rail jams and different contests that are going on around there? Definitely, yeah. As soon as we had our driver's licenses, like 16, 17, 18, we were nonstop every weekend trying to go somewhere for filming or for a rail jam or a big air contest or folk style. Like, there was a whole bunch of contests in Vermont at those days. Mount Snow would always have a bunch, Killington up to Sugarbush and Stowe and stuff. There was always something going on. So there was a pretty strong East Coast scene of ski events at that point. And like a lot of them had money to win. So we were using whatever we could from winning stuff to go to more and just keeping the cycle going. Did you guys like contests back then? Because when I think of your skiing today, I don't really think of contests by any means. I mean, sure, you have the X Games, but that's more of a video contest for you. But I don't think of you guys as entering contests. And I think of you as almost the ante. It's like creating a new style, doing something totally different than everybody else is doing. But back then, were contests cool? Or was it just a way to try to get some cash and see your friends? I don't think we ever thought they were super cool. But definitely, it was really awesome that whoever put all those together made it possible to win money rather than like win a pair of skis that fit some size that doesn't fit you or something you know like it was pretty cool to have the opportunity to travel all around the east coast and meet people from all over new england and even quebec sometimes like met a lot of my future friends through that like east coast scene kind of thing and i definitely would not associate myself with contests these days either but Those early contests were a little different because it was so new and every contest people were throwing new tricks and it was pretty exciting. It was like videos are now kind of. It's hard to explain, but contests now, there's still new tricks for sure. They're just so insanely technical. There's only a small pool of people in the world that can do them or have access to facilities to learn them. Yeah. And back then it was like, oh, this guy did a cork nine. Crazy. (laughs) Like... Let's try it. Like, how do we do it? Okay, just throw your body. <laughs> there wasn't like some coach being like, okay, now go to the trampoline and now go to the airbag and now you're allowed to try it. Yeah, what do you think of contests today? Because like you said, there's coaching, there's quads, there's all kinds of crazy shit that where you say like a 900, that's like half of what people are doing today, which is insane to me. And it's hard to even call the tricks because they're happening so fast. But when you look at the progression of contest skiing what do you think of it because to me it's almost getting to be similar to aerials i draw parallels between aerials and certain events these days but there's still lots of cool contests it's just harder when you make something so specific and the course is like defined every course is the same and maybe there's a slightly different variation of down rail or something but it's like oh down flat rail cool but the whole point of Reskiing, from my perspective, was to get away from strict rules and like strict courses and lots of coaching and stuff because it's kind of like what mogul skiing used to be was old free skiing. And then they put in the Olympics and made so many rules that it wasn't fun anymore. And then these guys just started doing all this other stuff outside of the moguls and in the moguls too, but not in the events. And it can go many different ways. And what drew me to skiing in the first place or free skiing was there was no rules and all these other sports I played growing up had rules and coaches and people telling you what to do and suddenly my friends and I were doing this thing that was kind of new and there wasn't any strict way to do it it was just like trial and error figure it out as you go and lots of surprises getting back to the crew I hate New York people are definitely aware of what you're doing they have been for a few years And there's a highly anticipated release of pterodactyl blood. And that video never comes out. And then eventually, everything seems to disappear when you guys lose your website. So what happens to I Hate New York? Pterodactyl blood is actually never supposed to be like a complete video in the video sense. It was supposed to be like a series of edits that we were going to make a website that 
you can choose the order that you want to watch it in and it plays as the length of a full movie. So we're trying to get all weird and creative there with like the format. We thought it would be cool to make like five or six edits, whether they be someone's segment or like a location. And then it's kind of like choose your own adventure style, like how those books are. Yeah. You just like go to this page and watch this one. So it was kind of like watch them in a row, but it can be a different movie if you watch it in a different order. And we did make the edit. I think one or two of them never got done. No one ever really grasped that concept. And we didn't have the video player ability to make our vision really come true. And then do you guys end up losing the domain? Because I know you had the website, I Hate New York, and then it seemed to disappear. And what happened there? I really have no idea. <laughs> I think probably Ross and Virgin is whatever happened, but... Yeah, we might have lost the domain or like stopped paying for it or something. But at that point, guys are going off to college around the Northeast. Andy and I went to different Vermont colleges. Eric and Shane McFalls is one of the guys filming most of the stuff. He came to Albany and Matt and Gry were still in high school, like back in New York. And so was Ross. So we were a little more spread out and started filming with Meathead Films, like the Steve East guys. Yep. And so we were a little less focused on our own kind of like crew movie style. It was just get as much as possible and try to go as many places. And the Meatheads really opened up a lot of opportunities and took us on so many trips all over the place. Yeah, I would say with the Meatheads, because you had already come out to the ski world under 22 on New Schoolers, showing them your backyard edits and the things that you guys were doing. But when you get into Meatheads, and I think Head for the Hills might have been your first movie with them, I'm not sure. But... When you get into one of their movies, you have a lot bigger distribution because people that are going to new schoolers to find the content that you guys are putting out are pretty young. But people that are seeing the Meatheads tour, they had a pretty heavy tour back in the day. So people that are going to see that movie are like, who the fuck is this Will Wesson guy? And I think that opens up a lot of doors. I think you even ended up with Best Jib in maybe 2008 or 2009 from a Meatheads movie. Yeah, I think the first movie I was in with them was Born from Ice, but it's just a small part kind of thing. That was my freshman year of college, 2009. And eventually yeah, it led to Head to the Hills, which was the segment where I had like a line at the end that got best jib from Powder or whatever. Were you even able to attend that Powder Awards? Actually, I got like a last minute opportunity to go to Finland. That was like my first big international trip with Level 1. So I was in Finland and Andy was actually there and accepted the award maybe somewhat intoxicated. <laughs> I still got the award and everything. At this time, uh, Matt and Friedel Cody talked to Berman and they pushed you to get into level one. And this is the really big break that you get because if you're able to turn some heads with the meatheads, level one's distribution's a lot bigger. And you're in every movie Berman's made since then. And it's guaranteed exposure for you every year. And that's really what has put you on the map in terms of we're going to see Will every single year. And we're going to see him here in level one. And then the career was able to grow from there. Yeah, I was lucky Herman and those guys gave me a chance to come out on a trip to Denver. I think it was my final year of college and it was Christmas break or something. I went out to Denver there for a week or two. We got a bunch of shots in Turbo was the movie. Yep. And... Then, yeah, like you said, just filming with them ever since and just got back from Finland again. So the exposure you get with Level 1's huge. I think they also end up getting you in, like, Warren Miller. They did get Warren Miller, the person, to narrate a lot of Refresh, which was a big deal because Warren Miller Entertainment ended up suing Level 1 because Warren Miller himself was separate from the company by then because his son or someone sold it off and they like owned the rights to his voice or something and then he couldn't record stuff for level one but they did and they ended up dropping it at all but i did have a segment where warren miller like narrated over my skiing which was pretty cool to see yeah that is one to check off the box for sure and in terms of your college what did you study while you were at vermont i majored in recreation and resources management and minored in graphic design so what would you do with that? It's basically like tourism business, basically skiing. <laughs> so marketing business, things like that, that are kind of generally applied to whatever you're trying to narrow it down to. And for me, it was like outdoor recreation and yeah, basically skiing. At this point, 
you're a skier, but it's not like you're making big dollars by any means. And you're also at a point in life where it's time to either make that pro skier dream come true or get a real job because you're getting towards the end of school. And is there a lot of stress in your mind of what the fuck do I do next? Definitely a lot of questions and real world scary things coming up like any college student I feel like feels that towards the end of their schooling and do I go to grad school do I move west or whatever and at that point Andy and I sat down and made like a PowerPoint presentation there's a couple different topics and one of those turned into traveling circus and one of those turned into telefrentor what Andy's doing now but we sat down with Jason Leventhal at line and was like hey please just pay for our gas money for this year basically and we'll make some videos and see if this idea works out and and that later became traveling circus so just stumbled into the next thing it was supposed to be just kind of a year off like a ski year basically and then that year turned into 12 years or 11 years or whatever we're at now and was jason fully into your pitch from the get-go or did you have to sell him on it and be like no man we're gonna do this it's gonna be great kids are gonna love it or was he like i see what you're doing right away and i'm backing it he was pretty into it. Definitely owe him big time for taking a chance on e bum kids. We had already made a bunch of videos for Line, and like he knew what we were doing with Meatheads, and I'd filmed my first level one stuff at that point. And we were basically taking inspiration and trying to be like what Eric Pollard was doing with Nimbus at that point. Nimbus had just started one year before, maybe, and they had put out episodes, and that was like the first really high quality e content online. There was all the annual movies, but there was like three or four episodes or webisodes. And we're like, why can't we just do this for park and urban and everyday, like relatable teenage kid skiing? All those guys don't have snowmobiles and powder and stuff. We just want to make videos for people like us. That first season, you and Andy were the ultimate dirtbags. I think you lived in Andy's Subaru and filmed everything yourselves. And you were the masters of making something out of nothing. And I guess speaking of making something out of nothing, that is you. You're the king of making something out of nothing. I hear there's no one more thrifty than you. And you only spend when you have to. Have you always been that way? Or has your style of skiing made you learn to be that way? I think a little of both. You've loosened up and realized when quality is necessary versus quantity and when actual food is better than ramen noodles. But the first year, for sure, we were pretty tight on finances and we knew a bunch of people who used to stay with somebody. And yeah, and it was nice enough to volunteer at Subaru, which was a lot bigger than my Volkswagen Golf, to just basically road trip all around to all the famous resorts in the west that we'd always heard about but never had a chance to visit and since we had this project going with line skis we could convince the marketing guys to give us free tickets and yeah we just oh we know someone in jackson okay let's go to jackson oh we know someone in mammoth let's go to mammoth just see what happens it was a big adventure so it's a glorified road trip and you guys are in such close quarters how were you able to put up with each other was there a lot of infighting between you two based on you living in a subaru we're never like 100% living out of his Subaru, but definitely in close quarters at all times. I think at that age, some people move down from the college life and being a little more comfortable and having their own space. And some people are just, let's see how many people we can cram into this hotel room or cram into this living room and air mattresses or couches or whatever. And we didn't really care about any of that because we we're used to it. We did been doing it for four years with the meatheads and once in a while we'd have a nice place to stay, but... The main thing was, what do we have to ski on? Not like, how nice is our accommodations, you know? So we weren't too bothered by it. And I think the things that caused the most stress actually were us filming it personally, like Andy and I switching off of the camera and we wanted to ski. So like, we like filming and it's cool to get a shot of your friend for sure. But (laughs) once in a while we'd be like, okay, I want to do my trick now. And by the end of the first year of nine episodes or whatever we did was a bit stressful with the filming and when they asked us to do a second season the first thing they asked was like okay what do you need to do better and we're like we need someone to film we can't be a filmer did you get a filmer that second season actually the very first episode like the pilot jay got us out to wendell's for our first time 
And Shane McFalls filmed that, our friend from New York who was a part of the original crew. And then he actually ended up getting a real job working for Mount Snow, making videos. And we filmed the next eight episodes of the first season. But then we were like, okay, we, Shane's going to like be the guy to do this. And luckily he was pretty sick of that year at Mount Snow, <laughs> having people tell him what to do. And was super stoked to just make ski edits with very little guidance and just support from line to help us make it happen. As things have evolved, you guys now have a van, you're able to stay in hotels, and you have some luxuries. Budgets are increasing. And while I'm on the topic of budgets, I might as well ask you about sponsorship. With making money in skiing, do you actively seek sponsorship, or is it something that comes to you? At one point, I was pretty into like trying to get more sponsors and stuff and just trying to make it happen. And thankfully, I've developed a decent relationship with a few of my biggest sponsors that has lasted like upwards of 10 years for most of them so they know they can trust me i know i can trust them and it's kind of just a year-to-year thing like okay what do you want to do different this year let's keep it going but these days i should probably try harder definitely losing sponsors (laughs) these years but uh not the main big ones that have always supported me but just smaller ones come and go and yeah i should probably try a little harder i guess (laughs) who are your paying sponsors today line and full tilt also scott Sports for poles and goggles, the ski monster.com, the ski shop out in Boston and also online. And those are my biggest backers that really keep me going. At one point, you had a Raj as a sponsor, and I thought it was a great thing for them. You were a sponsor's dream. You're going to bleed skiing, spend too much time on the road in vans, wherever to create content. And I'm thinking a brand garage, it really fit their roots of supporting what's cool in skiing. And they had a great crew of urban skiers, and that whole crew got shit-canned. What happened to that relationship? Because it seemed like they had a lot for a little, and they got rid of it all. Garage did a great job supporting us, and unfortunately, they had some changes with their owners and switched up their approach, basically, and fully decided like free skiing and park skiing and urban skiing was not really something they wanted to focus on anymore and just go kind of more the way of the touring backcountry style that's been taken off these past, I don't know, past five years or so. People have really focused on that. I feel like a lot of companies have moved in that direction. It was just a weird thing where they had the best and then they decided to let it go. Were you surprised when that happened? I kind of slowly saw it happening over the years, but was a bit surprised for sure. It was kind of abrupt in the way they did it. Wasn't the best, but I mean, that happens. Lots of people go through things like that and pretty cool that anybody wants to pay you to ski in the first place. So I think a lot of brands are still kind of searching for what they are specifically. And if they want to zero in on one aspect, that's cool. But I also think if you have a brand that's big enough to be able to support multiple types of skiing, it's cool because you can get the kids interested when they're younger and kind of develop a relationship with people that trust your products over their lifetime rather than just kind of like making like one specific thing for a specific type of skier. Now I'm going to take another break to talk about sponsors and my next sponsor is Spy Optic and I've worn a lot of goggles and sunglasses in my day. None have the fit and function of what Spy delivers. On the snow, I rock the Ace EC. It's a high-tech chromoplast lens that becomes three lenses at the push of a button. It is the best goggle ever made. Off the hill, I wear the Hate 2 sunglasses. And there's a ton of other frames that I like, but that is my favorite. There's a ton of choices for you, and while I can't offer you a discount on the Ace EC, which is arguably the best goggle ever built, I can offer you 20% off Spy's entire site. When you're at checkout at spyoptic.com, enter the code capital TPM, the number 20, all one word, and you'll get 20% off your entire order. My final sponsor is the 10 Barrel Brewery out of Bend, Oregon. They make beer and like to drink it outside, and the beer they make is awesome. And when they're not making or drinking their awesome beer outside, they're supporting some of the coolest projects and events in snow. The events start up on March 9th at Copper Mountain with the first of three hella big air events. On March 23rd, there's the Goggle Tan Rail Jam at Ski Bowl. On March 30th, another hella big air at Mount Bachelor. 
And the third and final hella big air stop has been confirmed at Sierra at Tahoe on April 6th. So a lot of cool events. They also have Mike Bassich's Beer Cat, which is the first ever snow cat pub. So next time you're out buying beer, support the brand that supports you, the 10 Barrel Brewery. You can find out more about the events, their pubs, and the beer over at 10barrel.com. Those are my sponsors. Now let's get back into the podcast. When I think of you, I feel like you're one of the one dudes that have always worn a helmet. Knowing that, I would think that you would have a helmet sponsor, but it sounds like you don't. I rode for Burn for quite a while. They still might still hook me up with just some helmets, but they unfortunately also got rid of their official team. It's hard because budgets are changing. Things are different. I feel like skiing and free skiing is bigger than it's ever been. It's just people are scrambling to cover all the different things to pay for. Like maybe they're not paying for a really expensive magazine ad quite as much as they were before, but now they're trying to focus on social media and nobody knows what to do with that or like what's actually valuable out of that. Like what do these numbers mean? Do they actually mean anything? I don't know. It's a big mess and everybody's figuring it out for themselves. And it's cool how certain brands like line wasn't super big when I was first online and they've, grown to the point where they can support people from all types of skiing. Like you got your kid that's like 12 years old and gets into park skiing and he gets lines and he likes the skis. And then maybe he grows a little older and then gets into pow skiing. And then there's a ski for him with line there too. That's kind of what I was trying to talk about with the Raj or whatever. I can see that. I know Andy bought a house at Hood and it might not be a fully paid for house, but he bought a house. I would think that skiing and whatever other job that he has is making that happen. For you, have you been able to stack some money and buy a house and do some of the things that adults like to do? Like you said, I'm relatively thrifty and definitely been saving my money for quite a while, probably since I was like 13 years old or something. I haven't bought a house yet, mainly because I missed the window. It was so cheap and such a good time to buy a house. Just about five to ten years ago, at least where I am in Salt Lake, and now it's like at the height of the boom. Maybe it's going higher, I don't know. It's hard to say, but definitely trying to buy low, not buy when it's crazy expensive. The cities are going crazy these days in the West, so I'm just waiting to see what happens, and I would like to focus on skiing and not worry too much about crazy life stuff yet, money-making stuff yet. Yeah, I still like the skiers, so not really a investment banker or anything. It'd be cool to learn a little bit about that, but I feel like I don't know enough to take some big chances at this point in my life. I think you take enough big chances in what you're doing. And speaking of what you're doing, you guys get to year three of the traveling circus, and you finally get a van out of line, and you get a sprinter van. And how do they tell you about the sprinter van? Because I'm sure that has to be one of the most exciting things about this whole project is when the sponsor of this thing that's probably not doing enough for you in the beginning is like, hey, we're going to back this even more. We're going to give you a vehicle and we're going to blow this shit up. Does that get you guys fired up and rejuvenated to make this thing even better than it already was? When we first were getting the van, obviously we were super stoked and grateful and happy. And it was the same thing, like coming out of season two into season three or whatever, whenever we got the van, it was like, okay, what can we do to make it bigger and better? I sat down with Jay and we were just like, we need to stop using personal vehicles because there's always like bickering. I'm like, oh, we're using my car more or whatever. And we'll have a small car. It's not good for road trips. And we would try to balance it. But in the end, it was just like, we need a road trip vehicle. And we were actually worried that it was going to be like selling out. Like, you guys are getting a van? They're like, probably would. <laughs> and then obviously we're just like, e-bombs in a van and that was pretty much right when maybe the whole van life thing started to see a resurgence and it kind of worked out with our image of that too i guess it was like okay this is just like dirt bag ski bums in a van <laughs> not like a fancy van it's a nice van but it doesn't have windows i would think that you guys get on each other's nerves at times but it could never be as bad as it was in the subaru for you two when you're in the van but when it comes to putting others into the mix who is the one person that you found it tough to travel with in close quarters? I don't think there's any one person. Everybody has their ups and downs with the van life. It's not easy to hang out with the same people 24-7 when you're tired and maybe sick or not even so great. 
but we're all there for the same reason and that's to ski as much as possible so we all kind of share that bond or whatever and get through any little bickerings about being tired or whatever who is the grossest personal hygiene that you've had to put in the van it depends on the, the situation like obviously andy and lj here or there in episodes have had like their stinky moments that they can like smell and watching the videos but you can tell when something's a little bit dicey john hartman actually our friend from colorado takes the cake for maybe worse smelling boots he skis barefoot oh man never uses socks so that could be part of the problem i don't know everybody's smelly at some point especially when you're not always having a shower and occasionally sleeping in a van in some random place and it's part of the fun Later on in the Traveling Circus days, you get invited to produce a segment for the X Games Real Street in its first year. I think it's 2016. Had you ever thought that you would get a chance to compete for an X Game medal with the type of skiing that you've been doing throughout your career? I never really thought about it at all initially. For sure, once they had snowboarding going for a few years there, I was like, oh, it'd be cool if they had skiing. But I never really saw skiing as being big enough to support that kind of contest where they're inviting new riders every year. And it's finally proven itself to be that way, which is pretty cool. But there was always like rumors like, oh, maybe they'll add skiing next year. And every year I was just like, yeah, I don't think they're going to do that. It's like one that's like very short time to film a video part in. And it's really hard to put out the best stuff you've ever done. Like first thing in the season. Right. It's like going from mini rails on like a dusting of snow to like some of the craziest stuff you've ever done. And you haven't really warmed up yet. You haven't had a whole lot of time to ski in the season yet. So I just figured like, yeah, they probably don't think skiing is big enough yet to offer a pool of people that can do this on a regular basis every year. But I think they emailed us like early December. I think they're like, okay, you can start December 5th. We just need all the footage by January 15th. Jesus. I never thought they were going to actually do it. I just got the email and was like, oh shit. Okay. Yes. We're doing this now. And that's got to put a kink in your season where you have all these plans and then you realize that you have to do this thing for the X Games because it is the biggest chance for exposure you're going to have in your entire career. And most of the stuff that you've done throughout your entire career has been anti-contest. It's putting together edits and building a following that the contest guys could probably never do. But this type of contest, is it a judge competition or is it a fan vote? It's judged. There is a fan vote portion to it. There can be fan favorite, which is going on right now for the guys that were in it this year. You can vote like once a day for two or three week period or something. And that fan favorite, I think, gets 5,000. And yeah, then there's like the official judge podium. And I think it goes like 20, 10, 5 or something like that. You ended up getting the 20 spot, I believe, because you won that X Games that first year, right? Yeah, the first year I filmed with Johnny Durst. And, yeah, that was a very stressful month and a half or whatever it is. But it worked out pretty well for us and got the extra kind of push to try some of the things I've been thinking about for years. And the weather lined up for us relatively decently and made it out injury-free, thankfully. Just a few bumps and bruises and a couple days off here and there. But With this, the expectations are higher than anything else that you've been a part of in your life. And do you feel like you have to do everything out of your comfort zone? Yeah, it's really hard to balance, or at least it was for me, skiing how I want to ski and skiing how I think I could ski for this big deal competition thing where people have high expectations. And like, at least with the video part, you have the entire season and you're kind of doing it at a slower pace. Maybe if you take a few hard falls one day, you're going to take some days off and really think it over. With this, it's like, okay, I got to get at least two or three shots every single week, probably more. I think it's like one every three days for that first year to have like enough footage to make this thing. And if it doesn't snow, we need to drive to the snow. And if I don't know features to ski on there, I need to drive around looking for them. And then I need to worry about getting busted and all the normal urban things. It's pretty stressful for sure. They've gotten their act together a bit more with the organization other than I think you can start. November 15th now, or at least late November. So there's another chunk of time. But if it doesn't snow during that time, then it's early season. You never really know if it's actually going to snow yet. 
it's a challenge for sure. There's a lot of challenges and a lot of things that people don't think about when you're going into the filming, especially with such a short window. And then you win this contest and you win $20,000, which is a lot of money. It can buy you a really low-end Chevy. I saw a commercial the other day that said that. But when I think of money in ski contests, I mean, this is the X Games. This is the Olympics for skiing per se. I mean, there is the Olympics for skiing now, but this is what's traditionally been the biggest contest in skiing. And you could win more on a night of Jeopardy or on American Ninja Warrior than you could at the X Games. Do you ever think about the prize money there? Like, well, this is this multi-million dollar event for ESPN, and they're giving the best person in the entire world 20 grand. I never really thought about the money. I was more like, I want to make something that's good enough for people's expectations for like this kind of contest and also for my personal expectations and do that without killing myself, which a lot of guys walk the line of that and find out the hard way. Like I hurt my hip during filming that first year and couldn't really ski for five days or something, but luckily it wasn't anything broken. I think everybody got hurt. It was like a blown knee, stitches, broken ribs, this skate shoulder. I think every single guy had their story about the hard times they had to go through trying to film that. And the first year was extra stressful. I feel like it's the first year. It's like, okay, it's got to be the biggest and craziest. And we're just kind of going off what snowboarding has done. And they're doing some really big stuff. In those days, like Dan Breezy and yeah. jumping off buildings and things. So it was really kind of like, okay, what do I do in this minute and a half? I need to check the boxes of all the things that you could possibly need for an edit. Do I need a jump trick? Do I need a wall ride trick? Do I need like technical rail trick? And I think halfway through the filming, I was like, all right, I'm pretty over stressing about all these like boxes to check and I just gonna like, do the tricks I think are cool and hopefully people think they're cool too and got super lucky that it worked out second year wasn't quite as successful still filmed the edit I was pretty happy with but we didn't get the footage as easy and as fast like the second half of it we spent in Finland and it like rained a bunch and it's just hard to do in such a short time yeah I can imagine and I speak with Clayton Vila every once in a while and I've known him for quite a while and He's, I would say, a similar type of skier. He's an urban skier. I wouldn't say similar, but he's an urban skier. And chatting with him for a podcast and talking to him about what he does to progress skiing, it doesn't seem like it's a lot of fun to him. When I talk to him about it, it seems like there's a lot of pain and everything is worth it when he sees the footage. But at the time, it's a lot of work and he has a lot of scars to show for that work. How do you feel about that? I mean, is it fun when you're doing it or is it fun when you see it afterwards? For sure, you can push it so hard that it just becomes work and it becomes painful and not fun and stressful. And there's always going to be hard times with every trip or with every filming opportunity. But you have to like find what works for you. And sometimes that is waking up crazy early, shoveling some giant jump and like some super high bus thing, and it's really stressful. And then it either works out or it doesn't. And sometimes that's going to a park and hitting a rail that a thousand people already hit before and you know it's not really that cool but it's fun so you're like releasing your stress there and maybe you get a new idea for a trick on a different rail or it's really case by case basis and everybody's got their own formula that gets the same job done in the end but to keep it sustainable and kind of keeping you want to do it every year you just got to find what works for you okay well at this point in the show I'm going to get into something called inappropriate questions. And I connected with Andy Perry, who is your partner in crime in the traveling circus. He's been your friend for 16, 18 years by now. And he's a, a unique individual who has a different perspective on just about everything. And I'm going to jump into inappropriate question number one with Andy Perry. Question number one, where is the weirdest place you have puked before after drinking? I think maybe in the trash can at the IF3, like, Pally P concert or something. <laughs> I had two big pieces of pizza, and I think we had to, like, make it inside to see Kelly P or whatever, and it was after all the movies had played for that day. And I was worried about how much it was going to cost to buy drinks at the bar there and decided I'd drink a lot of the gin that I had in my pocket right before I went in, and that was a bad idea. So being thrifty causes you to puke within the show. 
Yeah, and then I missed the show because I was just like, oh, I, that wasn't great. I'm just going to go home. Well, I guess you learned something from that. Maybe it's worth paying the $4 for a drink. Yeah, or just don't drink. We'll jump into question number two. How many different girls from different countries have you gone on dates with? <laughs> uh, hmm. I would say probably five to seven. <laughs> I don't know. Not a big number by any means, but question, when you're traveling and you're all over the place, are you using Tinder or any other of these mobile apps to meet women on the road? I have four for sure, but definitely have kind of realized that maybe that's not quite what I'm looking for these days. It's nice to talk to people in person and meet people normally. I've met cool people through that too, that are just like everybody else, you know, it's, it's an app and there's lots of cool people out there, so sometimes you might not meet them if it wasn't for like, having that thing. Have you ever taken anyone back to the van? No. <laughs> People have who I shall not name, but I drew a line between the van and girls. All right. We'll leave that at that and we'll jump into our final inappropriate question. Final question is, tell us about you and LJ almost getting into a fight in Korea while you were drinking at a bar. There you go. I think it was in South Korea, we were there for Curling Circus. That trip was like 45 days long or something. We went to Japan for three weeks for level one with a few other guys. And then we went to China for one week for Traveling Circus. And then we went to Korea for Traveling Circus for another week. And I would pretty much like reach my breaking point of exhaustion. And I think LJ said I did something that just like rubbed me the wrong way. And, you know, we decided to pour beer on each other. But there was no actual fighting. It was just two tired guys that had spent too much time together getting grumpy. Well, speaking of a tired guy, I can imagine you are one because you have been traveling the world the past couple of days to get back to this great country that we call the United States. And we've been trying to make this happen for a while. We finally were able to put it down. I want to thank you for your time. And it's been cool seeing you from that quiet dude who would just stand in K2 by your van in there working on it to being the quiet guy who has taken over the ski world and changed a lot of kids' lives. And you've put in a lot of hard work. You've made a lot of shit happen. And it's all been with your actions and not your words. And that's pretty awesome to see these days. So I thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you. So that was time with Will Wesson. And I know I've said it like 15 times, but Will is a quiet person, and that's totally cool. You don't have to have a huge personality to make it in the ski world. But I will say, if you have that talent and a huge personality, I personally believe your career will be more lucrative and longer. But that's me, and becoming a pro isn't all about money, even though I always like to ask about it. The nice thing about Will is that he is armed with a bag of tricks and a degree, and that degree that he has in his back pocket is ready to use whenever he decides to put skiing in the rearview mirror. That's the show for this week. As always, I want to ask you to review me on whatever platform you listen to me on. I know I've been asking this for a while, but looking at the numbers, you aren't listening. If you get a minute and are on iTunes, please click Podcasts, search for the Powell Movement, click on the Powell Movement icon, scroll down to where you see the stars, and give me a five-star rating or whatever star rating you think I deserve. It really helps the show grow and is greatly appreciated. Finally, I want to thank you for listening and thank my great sponsors, Evo, Rescue Water, Spy Optic, and the Ten Barrel Brewery for supporting the show. Have a great week, everyone.